Howdy there, folks. If you follow Calgary or Alberta news, you might have heard of an individual by the name of Kevin J. Johnston. He's a candidate in the upcoming Calgary election, and he's been in the news quite a bit lately for such things as threatening Alberta health services workers and his very anti-COVID, anti-mask stance, which involves a lot of organizing rallies and events that go against public health codes. He also seems to think that he's already been elected mayor of Calgary, despite the fact that the election isn't scheduled until next year, so he might need a refresher on exactly how elections work. I've spent some time looking into this guy, just trying to dig through the internet and see what I can find on him. And who boy, I have found a lot of stuff. So I'm going to go over some of the more interesting stuff here. Um, I did find a fair bit, so you can look in the timeline to find timestamps of the different points. I'll include kind of more serious issues that involved either contact with the media or with the legal system, things that don't seem to have been as publicized but that I still think are concerning, and then the stuff that's just outright absurd and worthy of mockery. I'd also like to note a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about involves his bigotry towards Muslims in particular, but a lot of other groups in general, including folks of color, women, trans folks, just running the whole gamut there, so just a heads up for that. The first time he really starts showing up in the news is during his 2014 run for the position of mayor of Mississauga. Turns out Johnson's actually not from Calgary, he's from the area around Mississauga, Ontario, and he does seem to have moved here quite recently. In that 2014 election, the most widely publicized aspect of his campaign was when he launched a lawsuit against a private organization organizing a debate, as well as two of his fellow mayoral candidates after he was shut out of a debate due likely to the inflammatory statements he had made in the past. I haven't found evidence of that lawsuit going anywhere, but in a separate debate, one of his opponents accused him of secretly recording a conversation with a junior member of his staff, as well as showing up to his doorstep and taking pictures at night, which seems like a very clear act of intimidation. In any case, Johnston lost the election, gaining 0.46% of the vote, but that did not stop his participation in Mississauga municipal affairs. In 2015, there was controversy in Mississauga surrounding the proposed construction of the Meadowvale Mosque. Now, members of this mosque had previously been meeting in rented spaces or in the residences of its members as they did not have a permanent facility to worship. They had proposed such a facility, and while some concerns were brought up, including such things as increases in traffic and noise, Johnson's concerns took a very different route. He spearheaded the Stop the Mosque campaign, which included handing out these flyers that he designed. As you can see, this flyer is titled, Why We Must Not Allow This Mosque in Meadowvale, with some fear-mongering that somehow Muslims worshipping would lead to, I suppose he means an Islamic takeover of Canada, despite the fact that these folks had been worshipping for decades without any issues. He complains about the practice of separate rooms for prayer for men and women, although as we'll see later, he doesn't seem to care very much about women's rights in other contexts. He suggests that the city can't profit in any way, which as far as I'm aware isn't generally the point of religious institutions. And tellingly, he suggests that the presence of a mosque will cause an increase in vandalism and crime, which is rather telling of what he thinks of Muslims. He also says that free speech, liberty, safety, and Canadian values must be protected. How preventing construction of a place of worship for community members who follow a different religion is protecting free speech, liberty, and Canadian values? He does not say. In any case, the proposed mosque was approved by city council, and at a meeting surrounding the subject, Johnson said that he had lost his job over the whole issue, as well as his ability to work locally. When I looked into his resume, which describes him as a marketing and graphic design expert, he says that he was the general manager at a company called City 500 Media from 2010 to 2014, which would line up with potentially losing his job over the comments that he'd made. However, it turns out that these statements of Johnson's were likely blatant lies. In 2016, Mayor Bonnie Crombie filed a hate crime complaint over an article posted in the Mississauga Gazette. Kevin Johnson was the webmaster and co-owner of the Mississauga Gazette, and while that article was taken down, it was reposted on Johnson's own website the same day. The author of the article is listed as being Mississauga Gazette editor Acton Michaels. Now, the original article has been taken down, but I was able to find a copy of it posted online. And yeah, it makes such suggestions as Bonnie Crombie is converting Mississauga into a dangerous war zone, converting Mississauga to Islam so they can kill our son just for being gay, and that she won't rest until all girls in Mississauga are victims of rich rapists. So that seems pretty worthy of a hate crime complaint to me. Now, interestingly, when I looked up the Mississauga Gazette, it turns out that that's an alternative name for City 500 Media. You might recall Johnson said he had lost his job over the Stop the Mosque campaign, which his resume suggested was a job at City 500 Media, 
but clearly, as of 2016, he is still working at that company. In another example of apparent deception, he confirmed that he had actually founded that online publication. While his resume suggests that he was hired by a pre-existing organization and promoted within it. So given that he was the one who founded the company, that again seems to be a fairly blatant lie on his part. To add yet another falsehood to the mix, the author's listed article, Acton Michaels, is described as being a seasoned veteran of journalism, but I wasn't able to find evidence of his existence outside of the materials posted by Johnson himself. And furthermore, the photo that Johnson had posted on the website, he describes as actually being an actor hired at some point in the past. However, the actor portrayed in the photo contacted the media to say that the use of his photo was fraudulent and no deal had been made to use his image. So the picture of Acton Michaels on the website was actually the picture of an unrelated individual, and despite being described as a seasoned veteran of journalism, he doesn't seem to show up anywhere else. So it seems likely that Acton Michaels is either a pseudonym for Johnson himself, or a pseudonym for one of his other associates. Then in 2017, Johnson was charged with a hate crime. Johnson was opposed to the Peel District School Board's policy of religious accommodation, which permitted Muslim students to organize Friday prayer groups. Johnson had posted allegedly defamatory material about the school board trustees online, for which he received a cease and desist letter. Shortly after this, Johnson posted a video offering a $1,000 cash prize for anyone who could sneak into Peel District High Schools and get videos of Muslim students praying that Johnson could claim showed hate speech. In order to receive the cash prize, an individual would have to sneak a camera into the school and record students praying. That recording would have to show the students' faces, and the person would need to provide the name of students shown in the video. As a quick reminder, these students would almost certainly be underage, and because he specifically wants their names and photos, that suggests that he might be planning on posting them on his websites and targeting those students. While the original video has been taken down, I was able to find this video clip on CBC News The National showing him offering that cash prize. But now he's turned his sights on Muslim students who are allowed to hold Friday prayers in area schools. I am offering $1,000 of my own money, cash reward, for any of you out there that can sneak a camera into any of these mosqueterias or mosque stages or mosque gymnasiums and get me the footage. For additional context, Johnson put this video out almost exactly two months after the Quebec City mosque shooting, which left many worshippers dead or injured, and contributed to a climate of fear within the Muslim community. Johnson choosing this time to specifically target students in this environment where they're already fearful seems incredibly disgusting to me. A few months later, the Peel Regional Police would announce that they had arrested Kevin Johnson and charged him with one count of willful promotion of hatred. While they didn't say exactly what the nature of the hate crime was, it seems likely it was connected to that video. After his arrest, Johnson would go on to Rebel News Media to suggest that if he is convicted of a hate crime, that will lead to Muslims being attacked and murdered in the streets. If I go to prison for this, every Canadian out there is going to begin to hate every Muslim out there. And that is not what I want. I don't want a war where Canadians look at, Kevin Johnston went to jail for criticizing Islam, my son is going to go to jail for this. Let's go and get Muslims. I don't want that because that is civil war. I don't want civil war. Canada is a beautiful place. It's my home. It's what I love. And it's going to fall apart if I go to prison. And that's the position that the Crown has put themselves in. If they put me in prison, Muslims are going to start to get assaulted, beat up, perhaps even killed countrywide. I don't want that. Hearings for the hate crime charges were delayed until after the 2018 Mississauga mayoral election in which Johnson was also a candidate. And as of spring of 2021, he still has not gone to trial over those charges. So we'll have to see how this situation develops. In 2017, Johnson was also sued for defamation by Mohamed Faki, owner of Paramount Fine Foods. According to this court filing from 2018, Johnson and an associate named Renendra Banerjee were sued over a series of eight videos that they had taken outside of Paramount Fine Foods and which contained a number of defamatory statements. The lawsuit against Banerjee would be dropped when he agreed to make an unqualified apology as well as a confidential cash payment, and also agreed that should he publish similar content, he would be liable for a $100,000 consent to judgment. However, Johnson did not make such an agreement, so the lawsuit proceeded against him. The 2019 decision lays out some of the statements that Johnson made, as well as some other aspects of his conduct that led to the defamation lawsuit. Notably, while the plaintiffs filed a great deal of material to support their claims, 
Johnson did not file any materials, meaning that he was not contesting the material facts on issue. According to the decision, Johnson had a history of using hateful language in reference to Muslims, including calling them racist terrorist scumbags, suggesting that Muslims are part of a system designed to rape, kill, pillage, and destroy, and that Muslims are in Canada to take the country over and kill him, his children, and the entire future of the nation. In July of 2017, Paramount Fine Foods hosted Prime Minister Justin Trudeau at a fundraising event. Johnson and his associate attended to disrupt the event and showed up and took a series of eight videos that were posted over the next week. The videos included statements suggesting that the restaurant was up to something nefarious, that you had to be a jihadist or have raped someone's wife in order to enter the restaurant, that Mr. Fakih himself is a terrorist, and that he is an agent of a Pakistani spy agency. Johnson was served with a libel notice, but doubled down rather than apologize, and so the lawsuit commenced in August. After the beginning of the lawsuit, Johnson would make even more false and malicious statements, including suggesting that Mr. Fakih hates white people, that he is a radical Muslim terror funder, that he is an economic terrorist under the investigation by CSIS and the Canada Revenue Agency, and that if anyone eats at his restaurant, they are supporting terror worldwide. In addition to these statements, on one day in August, Johnson approached Mr. Fakih, who was at a public mall with his three children, and began calling Mr. Fakih a coward and accused him of supporting terrorism and funding terror organizations so that they could cut babies in half. Johnson filmed and photographed Fakih's children, and when the group tried to escape by leaving the mall, Johnson followed them out into the parking lot. Since the videos were published, Fakih had been approached by members of the public who commented on having heard the statements. His son told him that he had been harassed by other students and that he feared that someone in their family would be hurt. And he lost out on a potential business deal worth more than $2 million the first year alone after the potential partner viewed the videos. Johnson also tried to avoid being served the lawsuit and was only actually served while outside the Region Appeal Courthouse and tending on criminal charges for promoting hatred. Johnson also harassed the plaintiff's lawyers by posting their photographs and contact information and encouraging his followers to contact them. One of the lawyers received a threatening voicemail from an individual identifying themselves as a member of the Nazi party. Finally, Johnson breached a number of court orders and did not attend hearings even after they had been rescheduled to accommodate his travel. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Johnson lost the lawsuit and was ordered to pay $2.5 million to Muhammad Fakih, as well as to cease making any defamatory statements about the restaurant, Muhammad Fakih, or his family. Johnson's response was to proclaim this as a great injustice, and that he had lost with no trial. To begin with, this was a civil case, not a criminal case. Johnson had not contested the material facts of the case. He harassed counsel and breached numerous court orders, knowingly stalled progress of the lawsuit, and made multiple false or contradictory statements to the court. Given all that, it seems unsurprising that he would lose the lawsuit. Johnson also violated the order to cease defaming the plaintiffs, who brought a contempt motion against him in April of 2021. The fact that Johnson claims he will not pay the fine may also have contributed to the contempt motion. There's a lot of Antifa clowns that are really fascinated with the idea that a baby killing terror funder sued me for two and a half million bucks and won because they had a Sharia compliant judge and I didn't have a lawyer at the time. Very fascinated on that, but it's junk. So, you know, goodbye, Antifa. Uh, I will never be paying anybody 2.5 million bucks. And as I've told all of you before, if you sue me and you win, just if you win, you're not getting paid. I refuse to pay anybody who defeats me in a lawsuit, whether it be a proper victory or not. Most likely it's all improper. Every time I've lost in court, it's never been in a trial. It's always been with funny paperwork or illegal procedures. All right. And 2017 was an eventful year for Johnson as he got into some additional shenanigans. In June of 2017, Johnson attended a pro-Trump rally held in Ottawa. According to Johnson's account, at the rally, he saw two counter protesters harassing a pair of women. And when he came over to intervene, he was attacked by a group of more than 40 people. The police took him at his word and arrested several individuals, but it later emerged that his account may not have been accurate. His description of the incident was self-contradictory and challenged by a number of witnesses. They say that Johnson had started a verbal argument with a pair of counter-protesters, yelling such things at them as, why do you want to kill all white people? And he then followed them into a nearby park. Witnesses say that he confronted protesters and stuck cameras in their faces before punching at the head of a young woman and pulling her to the ground, at which point he was attacked by a group of counter-protesters. He also said that even though Antifa are kids, they're no longer human beings to me, which is a rather bad way to view one's opponents. He also got into further legal trouble 
regarding additional statements he made surrounding those events. An independent photographer and journalist named Kevin Metcalf had been in Ottawa to cover the pro-Trump march. Johnson alleges that Metcalf was at the scene documenting the assault and that he had withheld video evidence, but Metcalf disagrees, saying that he was on Parliament Hill at the time as well as doing an interview with the CBC. Johnson would post a number of videos about Metcalf, calling him a domestic terrorist, fascist, and criminal, suggesting that he is extremely dangerous, and that he attacked Johnson while armed. Metcalf sued Johnson over the defamatory remarks he made, though I have not found the results of that lawsuit. Then there were some legal proceedings surrounding the beach incident. Johnson alleges that in 2015 he had witnessed a crime. On a section of beach that Johnson claims is public property, but that residents who lived in the area say was not, Johnson saw two residents call a pair of security guards who he says assaulted an unnamed third party. Johnson said he was told that the residents also shouted at beach visitors, telling them that this section of the beach was private property. And Johnson says he was told by others that this type of, quote, verbal abuse is commonplace. Johnson does not identify who told him that, and says he returned to the same area of the beach later that day, and was shouted at by one of the residents, which Johnson alleges inflicted mental harm. Interestingly, the police would lay charges against Johnson a week later for what Johnson described as assault and trespass. Those charges were resolved without a trial when Johnson agreed to a peace bond, where essentially a person agrees to be on good behavior for a period of time in exchange for not being charged. The decision points out that Johnson did not make any specific allegations against the personal defendants, and that there was no reasonable cause of action for infliction of mental distress. So Johnson lost the case pretty spectacularly. Then there was the 2018 Mississauga mayoral election. Despite the ongoing hate crime charges against Johnson, he chose to run for mayor again. He would tell a crowd at one event that he feels that the hate crime charge was brought against him in order to hinder his second run for the Mississauga mayoral office. Seems like he's just trying to avoid taking responsibility. He would briefly withdraw from the mayor race before resubmitting his nomination within 24 hours, and he would once again lose to Bonnie Crombie, though this time gaining 13.49% of the vote. Then there is everything surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic. It might surprise folks who have been following Johnson to know that when the pandemic first started, he did in fact believe that it was a serious problem. Zip Picante said that Italy was the first EU country to introduce the drastic measures. Now, let me just comment on that. Um, yeah, good for them. I hope 10 more nations follow immediately. Nothing wrong with that at all. You're protecting your citizens. It's your duty to protect your citizens. Without your citizens, you don't have a tax base to make money from. Let's face facts. You want money, you need people. Let's keep the people alive, shall we? And not only that, as you can see here, he supported such public health measures as lockdowns and mandatory quarantines. The pair have been isolated in Rome's, oh man, can I say this? Spelezani Hospital a specialist center for treating infectious diseases and in their hotel room in the central Rome district of Monte near the Roman Forum has been sealed off by police. Good move. No, it's not an overreaction. It's a very, very good move. Johnson then seemed to disappear for a period of several months. He published an article about COVID on February 1st, 2020, and then his next video was not published until October of that year. In my search for an explanation, I found this article. According to the article, while being hit with a fine of $74,000 for improperly placed campaign signs, Johnson approached and harassed the Crown Prosecutor in his hate crimes case, and so was arrested and spent some time in prison. Johnson's next video about COVID-19 would be published on October 13th, by which point he seems to have changed his mind and decided that the COVID pandemic was a huge hoax. He attributes this change to one Dr. James Sears. When I looked Sears up, it turns out he has been convicted of hate speech and spent a year in jail, and also had lost his license to practice medicine two decades ago after being found guilty of sexual impropriety. Sears is apparently also the editor of Canada's largest pro-Nazi newspaper, so personally I don't find him a persuasive source on anything to do with the COVID pandemic, or anything else for that matter. Johnson would go on to post a number of videos showing him serving lawsuits to a number of different establishments for enforcing their measures to protect members of the public against COVID. And he would also attempt to sue Doug Ford over his COVID response. Johnson would also kick off his Calgary mayoral campaign with the slogan, Make Calgary Great Again, so drawing a pretty explicit comparison there to Donald Trump. 
Then, of course, Johnson decided to target Alberta Health Services for enforcing public health orders. He said he intends to harm AHS staff if he's elected mayor of Calgary, and told AHS workers that if SWAT won't come, he would simply arm himself and come right to their doors, as well as asking his followers to track down names, addresses, license plate numbers, and any other information about every staff member of Alberta Health Services. He also seems convinced that if elected, the police will serve as his private army to enforce his will. Because the day I take office, I'll be declaring you a terrorist organization and sending out my army. That's going to be Calgary Police Service. Concerningly, he also seems convinced that he will inevitably win the Calgary election. She knows she's going to get arrested when I am mayor of Calgary. So she goes to a judge to protect her freedom. That's what this is all about. I'm going to win this election. There's nothing that anyone can do to stop that from happening. So that's him saying that there's nothing anybody can do to stop him from winning the election, which given that an election is where people choose their representatives, Johnson seems to be acting like that choice is irrelevant. So that doesn't seem like someone who loves freedom and liberty to me. Hilariously, Johnson has also posted videos to social media suggesting that he has already won the election because there are already so many of his signs scattered around the city. However, the pictures of these signs seem to have been taken in the fall as there are freshly fallen leaves on the ground, and other photos he's posted suggest that these pictures are actually from one of his Mississauga mayoral runs. So that seems deliberately deceptive on his part. Then there are the assault charges surrounding an incident in Dawson Creek, BC. Johnson had visited a local no frills in order to buy some soap. When asked to leave as he wasn't wearing a mask, Johnson tossed some money down and claimed that somehow that made the soap his property and they couldn't take it from him. <laughs> Bar soap, three bucks, five dollar bill. I got all these teenagers here telling me that I can't be here and I have to leave this behind. But here's the way the law works. They owe me two bucks. I'm going to leave this money behind. Okay. Here you go. Yeah, you so you guys owe me two bucks, and we're out of here. You're not leaving with that. Put that down right there. If, if you touch me, you're gonna be Leave arrested. That. You're gonna get charged. Leave that I just, right now. I just paid her. We didn't accept it. Leave right now. I just paid her. No, 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 no. There's the five dollar bill. We are not yes. accepting that five dollar bill. It hasn't been signed. The no frills manager followed his group into the parking lot in order to take photos of their license plates, at which point Johnson approached him and shoved his camera right into his face. When the manager pushes the phone away, he makes contact with Johnson, at which point Johnson punched him well on camera. And there's Dave. Going to take pictures of our license plates. Atta boy, Dave! Good job, Dave. Atta boy! Get out of here. Hey, Dave! Johnson also suggested that this was the second time that the manager had assaulted him. So for context, let's watch what he claims is the first time. Oh. So you can't just do that. Well, this don't touch me. Don't touch me. Right there. Because they're they're all they're all yelling at me. It's weird. Anyway, that's that's five bucks. You guys have my money? It's right there. Well yeah, I do. Thank you, Dave. We can go, see? But Dave did touch me. So I may or I may not call the police. So the manager briefly touches him, which Johnson chooses to portray as an act of assault. So that seems kind of pathetic on Johnson's part, to say the least. Interestingly, Johnson has also claimed that he is never returning to Mississauga, Ontario, as shown in the following clip. But at the same time, with Uber being the big thing now, I know that, for example, like if, if I was to be back in Mississauga, which is never going to happen, but I can take uh, an Uber. Johnson does not elaborate on why he's never returning to Mississauga, although my personal theories involve the charges that have been levied against him. While those are the major incidents Johnson has been involved in, I have found plenty of other examples of his bigotry. Liberal Member of Parliament Ikra Khalid proposed a motion to Parliament, Motion M103, which would condemn Islamophobia and all forms of systemic racism and religious discrimination, create an approach to reduce or eliminate racism and discrimination, collect data to better understand hate crime reports, and make findings and recommendations to the House. 
Despite the fact that M103 was not a law, but instead simply a proposal to take Islamophobia and other bigotry more seriously, Johnson chose to target both M103 itself as well as Ikra Khalid personally, posting such videos as this one, calling her a Muslim Brotherhood wife-beating supporter, and saying that he believes she is a terrorist here to kill him, his children, and the future of Canada, that her actions were going to cause a civil war within Canada, and that he would be there to see her shot, with a big fat smile on his face saying that she got shot by a Canadian patriot. Johnson has posted many other videos attacking both Muslims and Islam, including this one which says in the description that, quote, Africa and the Middle East are not civilized parts of the globe, and the people who come from those places are not enlightened, nor are they even deserving of being called people. So that's rather telling about his worldview. He suggests that the Rohingya, victims of ethnic cleansing in Myanmar, are actually the invaders who are raping and killing Buddhist children on a genocidal scale. He continues to this day to deny the genocide of the Rohingya, suggesting that they instead are the aggressors. Johnson also appears to be masquerading as an ex-Muslim woman on social media, decrying the dangers of Islam. The Twitter account used to be called at Star Wars Valiant, belonging to a Kevin Jackal Johnson. In this account, where he again poses as an ex-Muslim woman, he claims that women do not make good leaders, as they think with their emotions and destroy countries, that women can't make tough decisions and fold under pressure too easily, that all women in Canada are mentally retarded, and insults the appearance of any woman who doesn't fit his personal standards of beauty. He also posts content talking about black people, which seems to have some very racist overtones. You can see in this picture, titled White People's Questions for Black People, where he portrays the black person with jail cell bars behind them in an orange jumpsuit where he has colored their eyes orange. Apparently, the original title of the video also included the N-word, so this seems like a pretty glaring example of his racism towards black people. He seems to hold a lot of racism towards First Nations folks as well, as shown in his Wasted Native coffee blend of his recently started coffee company, with the slogan, Forget Gas, Huff This. So, very, very racist, again. He also seems to be very bigoted against transgender folks, and suggests that the Canadian school system is involved in a plan to rape and attack children by giving them access to gender-affirming care. And he seems to be a member of the Canadian Nationalist Party, which is pretty explicitly far-right and white nationalist. He also has this weird thing where he posts videos of himself confronting bylaw officers who are enforcing public health orders, and characterizes this as hunting bylaw officers. He posts quite a number of videos of doing this in Mississauga, as well as videos of doing the same in Calgary. As I mentioned earlier, I also found a great deal of, of Johnson's past actions that are both absolutely absurd and worthy of mockery. First off, we have the lacrosse saga. I found a post on Johnson's social media where he promotes a book he has written called Lacrosse is Dead, where he describes the Ontario Lacrosse Association as being corrupt and having committed a ton of crimes. I figured there was a story behind this, and it turns out there absolutely is. Apparently, in 2016, Johnson was the volunteer house league convener of the Mississauga Tomahawks. It had initially been proposed that the Mississauga Tomahawks, as well as another house league called the Michael Lacrosse, participate in a one-time controlled scrimmage with Ontario Lacrosse Association certified coaches. Johnson changed this to a series of controlled scrimmages, which would be full contact and where he would be on the floor as a referee. This conflicted with what Mimaiko had agreed to, and they declined to participate, at which point Johnson sent out a statement where he claimed the Ontario Lacrosse Association had told Mimaiko that they couldn't play in Mississauga. Michael clarified that they had chosen not to participate in the event, and that they had not been threatened by either the Zone 10 director or by the Ontario Lacrosse Association itself. The Ontario Lacrosse Association would also clarify that their officials were not approved to officiate in any event that they themselves had not sanctioned. Hilariously, Johnson had decided to name this series of scrimmages the Kevin J. Johnson Cup after himself. A little bit egotistical there. Johnson would then go on to publish a great deal of material on social media, attacking both Colleen Grimes, daughter of a Toronto City Councillor and a member of the Ontario Lacrosse Association, as well as Wendy Bennett Castant, the Zone 10 director of the Ontario Lacrosse Association. In response to Johnson's attacks on social media, a code of conduct violation was filed against him. Johnson was summoned to a meeting discussing his conduct and disciplinary action, at which point he published this four-page response where he demanded that the Ontario Lacrosse Association disclose all details, including who issued the complaint, 
or else Johnson would declare the entire Ontario Lacrosse Association uncooperative and acting with malice and deny them the privilege of holding his disciplinary hearing, where he states that he doesn't recognize the authority of the Ontario Lacrosse Association Board of Directors or of any other nonprofit organization in Canada or the world, and where he states that any threats or intimidation tactics, which seems to include any attempted issuance of a fine, would end the hearing in his favor and which would result in him filing criminal charges against the entire Ontario Lacrosse Association for extortion the very next day. Johnson posted this statement on the unofficial lacrosse fan forum, where he claims to be a former private investigator, which I have not found any evidence of, before threatening Colleen Grimes by saying that if she got involved, he would go after her father, dig up dirt on him, and prevent him from ever being elected again. Other commenters rightfully point out that this is a veiled threat, and also point out the absurdity of him naming the cup after himself at which point he directly compares himself to Donald Trump and Trump Tower. Others in the thread point out that if he isn't a sanctioned referee, then insurance might not cover a traffic accident. Traffic accident. <laughs> Other commenters point out that if he isn't a sanctioned referee, then insurance may not cover any accidents in games that he is officiating. And one respondent in particular, who says they've known Johnson for several years, says that there have been a number of complaints made against him and that they personally know many players and families who stopped playing due to Johnson and his management of the lacrosse team. This person also says that Johnson had redesigned the logo in 2016 and that they considered the design to be an offensive caricature of Native Americans, which, given the logo itself, seems fair. This respondent also discusses some potential financial improprieties on Johnson's part. Apparently, lacrosse fees were being directed to a PayPal account in Johnson's own name. In some cases, parents had difficulty getting refunds, or the online registration wasn't accepted, and they had to register and pay a second time through the right platform. The Mississauga Tomahawks Registrar and Treasurer apparently had no control over the online registration or access to the information on who had registered and how much had been paid, and apparently, House League coaches were not registered and did not have background checks completed, and it seemed that about 70 House League players were also not registered, as the Mississauga Tomahawks did not have records of these players, and there was no signed agreement between the players' families and the Tomahawks themselves. The commenter suggests, but says that they have no specific evidence, that the fees Johnson collected may not have been released in the Mississauga Tomahawks, and since there was no signed agreement, those players may not have been covered under the insurance program. The disciplinary process moved forward against Johnston, and true to his word, he filed a lawsuit against both the Ontario Lacrosse Association and a number of its officials. According to the court decision that I found, this lawsuit by Johnston was dismissed, as it did not actually describe what the complaint was about. According to the decision, the statement of claim made no specific claims against the individual defendants, and that Johnston claimed that the Lacrosse Association had falsely disciplined him, but Johnston agreed that he had not taken the steps available to him to appeal the decision. Johnson did not plead any facts that would support his case, and he did not even attend the disciplinary hearing, nor did he appeal the suspension through the measures available to him. So again, unsurprisingly, Johnson fails in his lawsuit. Despite this failure, he would go on to continue accusing the Ontario Lacrosse Association of heinous crimes, and continue to post video stunts of himself where he claimed to be serving them lawsuits. Again, he published the book Lacrosse is Dead, which reveals how incredibly petty and spiteful he is over being kicked out due to his own misconduct. All of the cases Johnson's been involved in that I've outlined here also show that Johnson really needs to figure out how to get a lawyer. In both the Lacrosse case and the Beach case, Johnson was self-represented and lost spectacularly due to his sheer incompetence at filing a lawsuit. And in the Paramount case, Johnston had no lawyer, even though his co-defendant did, and while he would later be accompanied by a licensed paralegal, he still had not gotten proper counsel. Interestingly, in the 2021 follow-up to the 2019 defamation lawsuit, while Johnston is described as representing himself, he finally claims to not understand the proceedings and asks for a lawyer. Though the judge points out that nothing has stopped Johnston from getting a lawyer before this point, and frankly it looks to me like this could well just be another delaying tactic on his part. Then, to dig further into the absurd, Johnson describes himself as the talk master. While following up on what he describes in his resume as his educational history, I found this post on the Sheridan College Alumni Network, where Johnson refers to himself as the talk master at talkmaster.ca. Now, of course, I had to look into that, and I was able to find a 2017 episode from his radio show titled Millennials Are Having the Least Amount of Sex of Any Group in History, where he describes what talk master is. First off, in the description, he says, take my course and learn how to cash in on all that available tale, which gives a bit of a peek into the nature of his advice. 
He describes in this episode what he means when he says that he is the talk master. So, guys, if you really want to know more about this, visit talkmaster.ca and hire me to teach you on the right way to talk, the right way to present yourself, the right times to talk, the right times to be silent, and the right ways that you can go out and meet chicks. And chicks, you can also hire me to get you to understand how to deal with men. You want to get what you want from a guy, I can teach you this stuff. I know what works and what doesn't. Earlier in that same clip, he also offers an example of the kind of advice that he gives. And as for all you guys out there who are fed up with modern feminism and you're fed up with society, you know what? Balk at all of it by doing what we used to do. You don't ask a chick out. What you do is you just walk up to her and tell her, you, you're gorgeous, and I'm taking you to dinner Friday night at 6.30. By the way, what's your name? Write down your phone number here so I can make a call and, and get you picked up. That's what you do, guys. It's all about confidence. So based on that episode, it looks like Johnson was really trying to get into that whole pickup artist grift. Given that he no longer seems to bring up being the talk master, I suspect that this attempt on his part, unsurprisingly, failed. He seems to have run a Twitter account and YouTube page called 300X for comics and video game commentary, and I found a reference to another YouTube channel he used to run called Jackal Halloween, which he describes as being the world's best place to learn how to build haunted houses on small budgets. So it seems like he briefly attempted to branch out, but seeing as his last video was published six years ago, he seems to have abandoned this attempt. Then about a year ago, he had a venture called fitnessfitness.fitness, .fitness, where he offers coaching on weight loss, muscle building, surgery, rehab, and nutrition. He seems to have no educational background on any of these topics. And while I have found videos he's posted of him working out, I have found no evidence that he has any knowledge whatsoever of surgery, rehab, or nutrition. Him offering such services seems dangerously irresponsible, which might be why he mentioned this for a couple weeks and then never seems to have brought it up again. He has recently, within the last few months, started that aforementioned coffee company, and he briefly seems to have tried to start the Kevin J. Johnston University, which looks to be modeled off of Trump University and has such video titles as Why You Aren't Special, the best university lecture ever, and Islamic Biology, Menstruation, and Why Allah Sucks. So that seems pretty on brand for Johnston. I also can't help but notice that on his resume, Johnston claims to be an experienced graphic design expert, and lists strong graphic design skills as his first and primary skill and qualification, but when I actually look at the materials he's designed, his skills seem dubious at best. As an example, take this poster, where he claims that if a business owner posts it on their premises, it will turn their business into an official campaign office of Kevin Johnson, which somehow will ban Alberta Health Services from this establishment. He does not seem to understand how AHS works. This poster is very poorly designed, to illustrate just a few of its flaws, he seems to use at least three different fonts, at least five different color patterns, including black on white, white on black, white on red, white outlined in black on red, and black on yellow, which is ill-advised, as particularly white on another color is quite difficult to read, especially when the text is this small. This poster also has no apparent visual flow. A common flow you'll see on either marketing materials or public announcements is this one, where the eye is guided to three spots along the page. As you can see, there is no apparent visual flow in this poster, as there's nothing to draw the eye to one particular area, nor are the different sizes of text used to draw emphasis to any particular idea. So, very poor design on his part. Another example is this logo of his mayoral campaign. For some reason, he decided to include a cartoon of his face, even though it does not match the rest of the design. He uses multiple color patterns in his lettering, which prevents it from being easily read. And the design as a whole is very confusing, with again no clear visual focal point, and some religious symbolism thrown in just for flavor. The graphics that he's designed for his articles don't seem to be visually any clearer, and he really likes using fonts that are unnecessarily difficult to read. So overall, despite what Johnson claims, his graphic design skills seem pretty shitty. So to summarize my deep dive into Kevin Johnston, he has a history of running in mayoral elections, where despite claiming to love liberty and Canadian freedoms, he doesn't seem to respect democracy very much. He seems to really hate groups that are different than him. He loves to use the legal system to harass people he doesn't like, but doesn't think that the legal system should apply to him in any way. And he seems to constantly want to copy Trump, including through failing his numerous business ventures. 
While trying to decide how to finish off this project, I came across this image Johnson posted on Instagram of a postcard that describes my feelings towards him very well. To paraphrase, Kevin Johnson, you are a giant turd who does not represent Calgary or Alberta, you are a racist loser, and I hope that you stub your toe every morning and get a splinter every night. May you also have extra long hold times on the phone and wait times in every lineup. Thanks so much for listening, folks. Have a wonderful day.